So, welcome to Design Thinking. Uh, my name is Mark Richards. Probably know a few of you. I uh, coach and train. Been uh, in the Telstra space for the last 18 months or so. Um, so, I give you a forewarning. When I picked a topic today, I deliberately picked something I wasn't an expert in. Um, but an area where I'm finding I'm getting really challenged um, and I'm finding a lot of growth um, through digging into it, which is design thinking. So before we kick off, anybody in here got any experience with design thinking? Exposed to it in the past? Yeah. A couple of wavy hands. Okay, so I guess to kick it off, design thinking is Trying to take an approach to design um, that's different, um, that, that's based on a completely different way of thinking to how we traditionally approach design. And I guess I'm going to start off with a bit of a quiz or a, a, an investigation. So picture you're looking at Telstra, uh, since it's been my life for the last 18 months in our dungeon. Uh, we use that as topical. So, Telstra kicked off Agile probably two and a half years ago. Um, and they started off by doing a couple of pilot projects, more than a couple. And they looked at the end of those few pilot projects and said, hey, this Agile stuff's pretty radical, but uh, it looks like it's going to make a difference to us. So let's get more serious about it. And if you're looking in as an experienced Agile practitioner, and you're looking at an organisation like Telstra and say, okay, well, they want to go from piloting Agile to being serious about it. Um, what are the most important ingredients you believe they're going to need to take it from something you pilot to something that's the way of life? Results. So, result? Result. Results. Open mind. Open minds. <coughs> Culture change. What else? The understanding of the principles, not just the practices. Principles. Behavioural change. Efficiencies. Oh, what was the last one? Efficiencies. Efficiencies. Good starting set. What are the tools we're going to use to help them achieve that? We're going to set up some group to drive agile adoption success. What are the tools in their toolbox? Where do they need to focus? How, what, how are they going to get that stuff? I think they need feedback about how they're going, not just you must do agile and go. They need feedback about how it's going, what they can change. Feedback? Understanding the difference between what we're doing now, so it's efficient and what wants. So understanding the difference. Understanding how it creates better results for customers. We still haven't got tools yet that time. Picture that you're an <coughs> agile coach, or you're a group of 30 agile coaches. What are your first suggestions? What do you mean by tools? Techniques, tools, where are you going to start to focus? What are you going to say, right, this is the next step in your agile journey, we're going to coach you and this is how we think you should start? I'll stick knots. Piece of paper. <laughs> 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 Objectives. Outcomes, features. Are you going to change? Configuration. Configuration. PPT. 
PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> What do you reckon is going to be the hardest thing to shift? Culture. Culture. <coughs> Anything else? Procedures. Procedures. It's getting fine. Getting fine? Incentives. Management. Incentives. So, interestingly enough, you've just probably done better than most of the early Agile strategy at Telstra did, from where they focused. <laughs> um, the concept in design thinking is too often you jump to the conclusion that you know the answer before you really know what the problem is. And it's a native thing. And the better you are at something, the more likely it is that you're going to jump in and say, I don't know how to fix that. I've got all the answers and the techniques. We need continuous integration. We need TDD. Uh, we need extreme programming. Um, we need this, we need that. And it's so easy to look at it and say it's all wrong and I know the answers. And the more readily you do that, the more likely it is that you're going to give the wrong answers. And the fundamental principle is how do you change it so that you have a way of attacking any problem that first focuses on understanding the real problem before trying to come up with a solution? And when I originally heard about design thinking, I naturally, because in my past I was a techie, went design thinking, oh, that's a new technique for uh, better loosely coupled software architecture, um, how to make robust designs that are changeable. And in actual fact, the more that I've dug into it, the less that I apply it to software, um, the more that I get stuck into other aspects of it. Because one of the first things that it really focuses on is empathy. Um, and if you really want to understand the problem, people can almost never tell you the problem. What do you want? They'll give you the answer of what we think that we want. They don't really know how to describe what they want. And you're kind of, here, this is what we want. And natively, a lot of us will say, well, this is what I think you should have. Um, but unless you take the time to dig into understanding where they're coming from and really connecting with their problems, it's very unlikely that you're going to get anywhere with them. So I'm not going to go into a whole history lesson of all the tools and techniques for it today. Um, I'm going to share with you a few thoughts on where to go to dig though. Um, one of those, uh, Stanford University started up what they call the D School. And it's basically a school about design thinking, trying to change the way people approach design. And uh, I saw a keynote by one of the guys who runs that school a couple of months ago. And he got up with a couple of examples. And the first one he got up with was he actually took us all down the wrong path as an audience. He said, if I wanted to design a better incubator for babies, and I needed it to be lower cost and more robust, how would I go about doing that? And then he threw to the audience, and everybody jumped in and said, oh, you do this, and you do that, and do the other thing. Um, and then he caught us, and he said, no, you're all wrong. Right? <laughs> You've all jumped to the answer of how do we build a cheaper incubator, instead of saying, why do we need a cheaper incubator? And the example he shared was, um, it actually came from Nepal. And Nepal had a really horrific infant mortality rate. Um, and the belief was that they didn't have enough access to incubators, they didn't have incubators that were functioning. Therefore, what they needed to do was to come up with a cheaper, more maintainable incubator, and they'd be able to address the infant mortality rate. And the guys at the D school who got that problem said, OK, the first thing we've got to do is go on a field trip to Nepal. Um, and they got out there, and they started to visit hospitals and talk to people in the hospitals. And they weren't far into the journey before they found out that there were a lot of incubators in the hospitals. They were all working, seemed to have plenty of them, there weren't too many babies in them. And they dug a bit deeper and they found out the problem was that most babies in Nepal aren't actually born in the hospital because the mother can't get there in time. 
And what happens is that the baby dies from cold while the mother's trying to get them to the hospital for treatment. And so they went and they started to visit mothers at home and figure out what they had access to in the home. Because they said, okay, well, we've got to come up with some solution that'll keep the baby warm until we get to the hospital. And they started to talk to them, they started to look at the living conditions they had because they were trying to think outside the box. And what they eventually came up with was basically a heavy, heavily insulated little dinghy sleeping bag. Uh, and they put together a prototype of it and they took it back to Nepal and they did some experimentation. And they found that it wasn't keeping its heat. It was good, it would get the babies some distance, uh, but it still wouldn't get them to the hospital. <coughs> so they did a bit more bit research and they found a liquid which had a uh, cooling gradient which kept it warm for a long time and then it would suddenly go cold. And they figured out that if they boiled this liquid, they filled it up in pouches inside the sleeping bag, um, that it would survive the time that it took most of us to get to the hospital. So instead of giving them cheaper, more maintainable incubators, they gave them these little mini sleeping bags and they gave stashes of them to the hospital so they fed them out to expectant mothers. And they reduced the infant mortality rate in Nepal by about 70%. So it's a really strong example of what happens when you look at a problem and you instantly jump in. But by responding, by actually going and connecting, something different happens. And then it led to another example. And uh, this is actually from GE Health. <coughs> so GE is actually very, very heavily agile. Uh, the GE Health area is 70% agile pro projects. Um, and they include Agile in all of their manufacturing as well as their software. <coughs> and the example that he gave was actually MRI machines. And he put up this great PowerPoint of an MRI machine that looks something like a space age gadget. And he said, uh, we wanted to design a better MRI machine. Um, and we started to look at it and we said, well, how are we going to go about improving it? They were already kind of state-of-the-art, but really they had a lot of competition that was also state-of-the-art. So they took their lead designer and he went out to sit in hospitals. And he sat in hospitals in the area where they used the MRIs. And his first experience on his first day, he's sitting there in this little observation room. And he looks down the corridor and he sees two parents with an eight-year-old girl walking between them. Um, she's obviously nervous. And as she gets closer to the machine, you can see they're kind of encouraging her along. And she gets into the room and she sees the machine, she breaks out in tears. Absolutely loses it. Hysterics, because she's seen this machine and it's like going from scared to absolutely terrified. And he's sitting there watching it with his pride and joy, watching it reduce this eight-year-old girl um, to the point where they had to actually um, anesthetise it before they could get her into the machine. And he started to talk to me. He said, how often does this happen? I said, well, 70% of kids have to be anesthetized before we can get them on the And he went back from that, really powerfully moved. And he started to think about not how can he make a better MRI machine, but how can he make something that traumatizes children less. And they started to go down the path of looking at changing the decoration on it. And they actually produced what they call the adventure lamp range of MRIs. <laughs> and they have a, basically like an MRI school they take kids to. And they have people who say, we're going on an adventure. And they have different adventure lands. One of them's made up like a spaceship. Another one's made up like a tent. Um, and they have these little colouring in books with the kids. And they, they go through this setup system with them to, to make it, we're going on an adventure. Um, and there's the little observation booth which the guy who operates it sits in that's very heavily screened, of course. And they make that look like a bus. So there's this whole story that the kids have been prepared with for the adventure that they're going to go on. They've changed nothing about the machinery whatsoever other than the decoration and the preparation of that information with the children. And they put that into hospitals and they reduced the rate of required anaesthesis by 65%. Um, that's really where design thinking is coming from. It's saying if you really want to solve problems for people, you've got to start by understanding what the problems are. 
and you've got to go and connect. And a lot of the tech tools and techniques really revolve around starting by gaining empathy, and then from empathy, using prototypes and ideation to test it, I guess going back to a bit of the lean thinking aspect, right? um, or lean startup, minimum viable product, test, ideate some <coughs> and grab it all in empathy. And the place where I've really been moved to apply it is actually in the agile coaching space. Because if there's one thing that, that I've seen time and time again um, in my Telstra experience, it's teams whose coaches were trying to move them at a pace that they weren't capable of moving. So you had a team that started here in a world that was very heavily process driven, extreme governance, extreme complexity, very heavily outsourced, very heavily vendor based, and a coach who was trying to get them to suddenly be doing very advanced agile and nothing goes on the wall unless it's about building a piece of software. And a total disconnect. And they really struggled with people who came in and, and knew all the answers instead of trying to find out what the problem was. And really challenged me, but it also challenged me in terms of the people that I work with. Um, how do we take a team and build empathy for the customers of that team in the team? Because they start to really understand where their customers are coming from. Right? Whatever type of customer, the customers who are going to use their software, the customers who are going to consume their status reports, the customers that they lead, the more that they understand them, the more effectively they can work as a team, uh, the better problems they can solve. And the favourite technique I've found is called empathy maps. And you'll see a few of them sitting all around the wall, and that's actually what we're going to spend most of this session doing. So the idea with an empathy map is that you try and put yourself in the shoes of your customer or the person with problem. And you look to answer a few questions. What are they thinking? What are they hearing? What are they seeing? What are they saying? And what are they doing? And in answering those problems, it often yields some really surprising insights. So, what we're going to do is, in the context of a large-scale Agile adoption, attempt to build a few empathy maps by breaking up into groups. So there's a swag of them around the walls. If I could get you to self-organise into roughly even-sized groups um, at the empathy maps. I want to send this map. We might need a bigger group. We've only got yeah. two people in there. Can I merge up in the one of the others? Merge up, yeah. Damn, we have to stand up. Okay. <laughs> All right, so you've all got a post it for a group that's going to consist exist in any enterprise that's thinking about our job. We've got procurement, who look after contracts and provisioning, statements of work, vendor management. Uh, we've got the PMA, we've got BAs, we've got test managers, we've got vendors. You've also all got a stash of post-its and some Sharpies. Take 10 minutes or so and working as a group, jot down, working your way systematically. In the face of an agile adoption initiative, what are they thinking, seeing, hearing, saying and doing? How about you guys? 
What's the problem? Uh, how can I help? Um, do I have the skills? Hearing, rumours, um, complaints, pain points, uh, doing, 
so I'm for Googling Agile. <laughs> um, but listening, empowering um, research, uh, and someone importantly said avoiding mistakes. Um, this one? Saying, um, what's your budget? Um, asking questions, um, saying we can adapt to work with you. Um, seeing, seeing the results, uh, seeing opportunity. Same money. Happy last. Testers are always last. Well, as a total history <coughs> group, maybe I should be the spokesperson. But it was interesting how negative the perception was. So testers were the test manager was thought to be uh, thinking, how can I test without a spec? Um, uh, how do I fit in? Uh, possibly thinking I want to go back to waterfall. Um, not really. Some of them think that, but I don't think so. Um, seeing test is not given enough time to test, which is actually what you see in waterfall. But uh, that also might be seeing BAs and devs talking to each other instead of BAs being absent, as they often are at the end of the waterfall program. Um, feeling that there's too much change all the time. Uh, feeling a loss of control, uh, feeling like maybe they have to try and be the, the quality and cop, uh, doing lots of testing all the time, um, also pushing back on things, possibly this might be more of a feeling, uh, feeling like a victim, hearing that testers aren't needed anymore, um, uh, hearing that testing is a constraint or a bottleneck. Um, here at Deadlines Pass. Of course, sound of deadline passing. That's right. We've got feeling. Sorry? We've got feeling. We've got feeling. feeling. The testers didn't get to say anything. They just felt. So there are, there are a few variations on the show. Um, so I guess. Just a, a quick debrief before we talk about a couple of applications. Hopefully you got a chance to see how that can kind of guide your way of thinking through a problem. Uh, it's quite interesting when you look at it from a different perspective what comes out. Some of the things that, that we've used it for, um, I've used it a lot as a retrospective tool. So probably my favourite, we had a team, they called the system team. And they were formed about six months into the Agile journey for a particular program. Uh, with a mandate to enable automated testing, continuous integration. Um, and there were a lot of big brick walls to crash through to do that. So the whole idea was we need to get more agile with our technical practices, we need a team of specialists who are going to do that. And around about three months into their journey, they were busy figuring out a better way for everybody else to work um, and had no clue how everybody else was working. Um, so we actually, when we kicked the team off, as a coach, I saw it as a real victory because we took a bunch of people from the technical governance group who spent their life authorising and approving designs and architecture and said, now your job is actually to build enabling tools for agile stuff. Um, and they were just completely disconnected from the teams. So we put a retrospective together and said, look, um, we want you to take each team that you're meant to be enabling and build an empathy map for them. And as part of that, they actually made every member of the system team a servant of one of the Agile feature teams. Uh, and their job was to go to their stand-up every day, listen to what they were talking about, um, try and talk to them about what the system team was doing, and then come back and build an empathy map up for them. And they basically did that over the course of an iteration. The team completely changed. Because they started to realise that they were so disconnected from the reality um, and everybody out there was sitting waiting for another do one to us instead of do for us. Um, another team we did it with, retrospective tool, it was actually a group of project managers. And we said, look, your customers, you've you got stakeholders, you've got the teams that you're feeding work to, um, you've got your management and you've got the PMO. Um, build an empathy map for each one of those. And it was really surprising what drew out for them in terms of what they were and weren't doing. Um, and again, triggered a lot of changes in that process. So that, that ability to just kind of step out, look at something from a different way, 
Um, the last one I'll share with you was um, a team that was actually having some internal struggles. Um, there was a lot of debate, funnily enough, between the testers and the devs. Um, <laughs> the devs were working long hours and the testers were saying, we've got too much to do, I'm waiting the devs to come and help them with testing. Um, and there was an awful lot of friction happening. And so we actually set up a retrospective. We had probably four different disciplines in that team. Um, and we got them to treat each other as team members, as customers. To say, look, at the end of the day, as a team, to get something across the line, we're all each other's customers because there's stuff we rely on each other for um, to get stuff over the line. And uh, we use the retrospective as a way to kind of draw out how your internal customers are seeing, hearing, thinking about you, what they're doing in response to you. Um, and it really generated some quite interesting insights and, and got the team moments there a lot. Um, so that's empathy mapping. Um, if you're on Google, the D School from Stanford, they have an immense amount of material um, and a lot of ways that you can kind of supplement on this. Uh, I'm out of time, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks.